And the idea behind it really is not to ever have malice or or wish ill on anyone. It's not about that at all. It's about focusing goodness and refocusing that energy where people need to be and giving them what they need to be. Accessing the breath is a great way to come back to the ner- this present moment. And one of the hardest things to do is work on yourself. When you work on yourself, it's nice, but when you see younger generations doing it, it's really nice. All right. How are you feeling, Tracy? Good. How are you? Doing well. You did some breath work today. I did. Your first somatic breath work journey. Yeah, that was something. <laughs> that was exciting. Yeah, tell tell us about it. So you and I met through Aaron, punk rock Aaron, out here in Morro Bay at Set and Setting, and that's where we are right now. If you're watching this, record, listening, whatever, we are in Morro Bay, California. Our mutual friend Aaron, no one knows her last name, but Aaron at Set and Setting, she's got a shamanic store. You guys got to check it out. It's amazing, and she's just built such an awesome community of psychonauts, really, and helping the community to heal and. It, just so grateful to have met you through Aaron and you were in my 12 week program structured flow all about integrating spirituality into everyday life and then you just got to experience somatic breath work a 40 minute long breath work journey for the first time today right and well it was really so much it was deep it was cathartic it was a lot of release and it was a lot of re- relaxation when we switched over to the parasympathetic nervous system. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was very interesting. And like the whole day has been brighter, nicer, better. Nice. And yeah, I feel it pretty much throughout my whole body. Just very much relaxed and patient with myself. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, anytime. So let's start here in terms of like your healing journey. What really called you to go deeper and on this path? Well, I had recently come home to Morro Bay after being a caretaker for my parents. And I was having a hard time with a lot of loss of my dog, who I had for over 19 years and also dealing with the the changing in my family and my parents' kind of end of life experience and and how that's all coming together. So when I got back, I experienced a lot of stress due to some conditions at my home, and I was just kind of spiraling out of control. It was really not so fun. Yeah, (laughs) it's definitely not, but you had the courage to, and not just the courage, but the awareness to know, hey, something's got to change. Like, at what point in the spiraling out of control were you just like at a point of, I'm going to give up? Like, like how did you get to a point of really surrender and answering the call, if you will? Really through the shop. Through set and set. Yeah. Morro Bay. Yeah. Shout out to Aaron, punk rock (laughs) Aaron. (laughs) No one knows her last name. We just call her punk rock Aaron. Yeah. I think it starts with an M. (laughs) Something like that. Yeah, I came in here one day and met Erin and attended some of the events she had here and saw through the feed that you were going to have a soul integration masterclass. So I talked to her about it and I I cried (laughs) because I was crying a lot during that time. And Erin was really compassionate and helped me and directed me towards you in your class yeah structured flow the 12-week program and you didn't really know what you're getting yourself into with that huh no way I was just I was probably double the age of most of the participants Mm, debatable okay well I was old enough to be their mom so that was kind of nice in a way But it was also interesting because 
it's a different perspective. You know, different generations have different perspectives. But I think that also is really a really good thing in the group because we had all ages represented, kind of. We had people that were pretty young in their early 20s, you know, all the way up to 60s. So, yeah, it was really nice that we had a gamut of a range of people. And that was exciting because having perspective from different age groups was enlightening. And you see, when you work on yourself, it's nice. But when you see younger generations doing it, it's really nice. It's really interesting right now. Like the world is waking up. Like it's, you see it, like you mentioned in the younger generations, and I do totally believe in quantum physics that the outer world we experience with our five senses is a reflection of our inner world. So when we can change that inner state, then we're reflecting that world outwardly. And this really was mind blowing for me in my own healing journey, because when I journeyed with ayahuasca, the first plant medicine ceremony back in 2019, I remember everyone saying that I was connecting with like, oh, the world's waking up, people are healing. I'm like, no, no, no. y'all hippies have been saying that forever. Like nothing's changing. I just had a very pessimistic view. And you have Oracle cards here, which we will get to later in the show. But fast forward from April, 2019 to March, 2020, when the pandemic hit and when it was first announced with the lockdowns, I could feel it with every sense of my being that this was going to be the catalyst to really that mass awakening. And what was interesting was with my own Oracle deck, I drew the fire card, which the fire is the same. It was very similar, if not the same as the Phoenix, right? It's burn it all down to rebirth and, and transformation. And I drew that card three days in a row and it was that confirmation. And that's when it really hit me that quantum physics truly is real because what I've gone back to time and time again is if I hadn't gone through this awakening process, then the the timeline in which I experienced reality wouldn't have had that lockdown and pandemic, right? And I think you and everyone listening can point back to times in their life when they started to surrender more, listen to the call of their soul, acquiesce with it, and start to integrate and make those changes And that's really when not only are you in more flow, but you start seeing all these massive synchronicities and more and more people being called to spirituality. Well, and we had a lot of solitude during COVID. So Mm -hmm. it was a good time to look inward and, you know, take that opportunity to explore yourself, explore all the dimensions of yourself and explore the physical aspects, the mental aspects, the emotional aspects, the spiritual aspects. And I think that a lot of people came into spirituality during that time because we had time to explore ourselves and we had time to contemplate and we were working in a different way. And so we got a little bit of our power back Uh and that sovereignty from our employer. And that was kind of nice too. I mean, we, society deserves that. We work our asses off. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And it, in your little bubble of reality in when the pandemic struck since, struck since we are going there, what did it look like for you those first couple months? I got laid off from my job and I had just moved here back to this area where, which was my dream. I wanted to move back to this area. So I was really happy about that. But it's a small community, and so making friends, you know, in that small, tight community when you come back was a little bit difficult. But I made some good friends. Well, let's talk about the community of Morro Bay. Yeah, because for anyone listening that's not familiar with Morro Bay, first things first, most of you listening have seen the fantastic and amazing movie, The Goonies. <laughs> yeah, so Goonies. good. So fun fact, that movie's actually filmed in Morro Bay. The very first scene, you'll see the famous, famous Morro Bay rock. And this is in the central coast of California. I actually live up in Santa Cruz at three hours north of here, Northern California. Morro Bay really is in this pocket that is like central California in between Northern and Southern California. 
And this town has 10,000 people in it. Like yeah. it is tiny. And my one of my favorite beaches and towns is right next to a Cayucas. I, I don't know how many people are there, but it's got to be less than 10,000. Yeah, I think it's like 6,500, 7,000. 6,500. <laughs> I mean, this is a, a small area, obviously, thir- not obviously, but 30 minutes south of where we're at right now and where you live, Morro Bay, is Cal Poly, a, a famous college, and SLO, San Luis Obispo, that is a big area in Pismo. But this directs community. There's something special about from Morro Bay, Cayucas, my, well, my favorite areas, Cambria, like th- this whole area. And you could speak to that better than me in terms of it being a vortex and the energy here. Yeah, well, there's a really great book, The Magic of Lumeria, and Christine Alfonso, I believe, is the author, and she's local here. And it's about the energy centers here that are located around this area. And we also have a big Shumash history here. And a large, well, 1% of the community, I believe, is Shumash. Oh, wow. And so out of our 285,000 people in this community, I believe 1%, but I'm not sure. Is that the county, 285,000? Okay, yeah. got it. So that's a big contingency and that the rock is kind of their sacred place. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on now with the rights to the ocean, for the Shumash and the sport fishing industry. So that's affecting the area here as well. And there's a lot of stuff going on also with the environment and our infrastructure. It's kind of an older town. And so there was a lot of changes. And we also have like a wind turbine farm that they're considering. So there's a lot of maybe a little bit of a lot of different, the age, the average age here is 56 or 57, I believe. So there is a lot of retirees in this neighborhood. So there is a lot of difference in opinion between, I think, the older and the younger generations here within the kind of city. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of fun. I mean, it's just light, lighthearted and everybody just wants the same thing, just to have a beautiful, fun, happy place to live. And we just have a lot of murals going up in our community and a lot of changes happening and that's really exciting we just had a iron man triathlon today, today which was cool yeah. that was really cool you guys had ten thousand people in town right and the, there's ten thousand people that live here i know it's crazy huh yeah that's wild so all right let's go here you are an architect and just hearing you speak about the demographics makes me think that you might be into economic development a little bit Yeah, I'm interested in all kinds of things that have to do with the community, really, and making it a better place and making it safer and making it also more community based and making people want community, you know, want Mm -hmm. that because we still are small and we need that. You got to stay mighty. And and right after this podcast, we're going to Forever Stoked. My my favorite artist, I saw these guys at Cali Roots, a reggae fest in Monterey, a couple hours north of here, years and years and years ago. And I remember coming down to Morro Bay two years ago when Erin launched an open set and setting, her store for all your shamanic gifts in events and gatherings. And I found out that Forever Stoked is in Morro Bay and I was like, no way. So instantly, like I've been coming back for several reasons now, but we're going to a paint night tonight and so cool, like being able to not only see my good friends here and a great community, great beach town, maybe not the best weather all the time, but sunny now, and then go do a paint night with like personally my favorite artists. Like that's really cool. So speaking about community, you guys have like a really strong community here, which is great to see even through the way Aaron's built that community in helping people heal through all kinds of modalities. She brought me in today to do somatic breath work. She has people coming in to do sound baths. I know there's meditations. Christy, one of our friends, a local does breath work. So many different things, even just leading talks about like psychedelics 101, like what is a psychedelic and why would someone want to consider a psychedelic in ceremony, like a plant medicine ceremony? We're not talking about recreational healing and it's so inspiring to see you guys come together like that. Yeah, I mean, it's so important to have a leader in the community that can help facilitate these things and can help you integrate because really it's not about the ceremony itself. It's about all the work and, you know, the healing that you got to do. And 
sometimes that's easy and sometimes it's not. And a lot of times it's both. You've had some challenges. I mean, you've been dealt some cards, girl, like from <laughs> from early age to what you're facing now and everything else. Like when it's challenging, what what tools have you been able to utilize to really help you push through that? Well, I would say a couple things. The breathing. Definitely. I've been using sound healing and kundalini yoga a lot and uh, practicing those modalities and also, you know, working with Aaron and exploring plant medicines and being in your mass run class. That was such an eye opener. I just learned so much about so many different, so many things that I had thought about, so many things that I had wanted to know more about, but maybe didn't know where to find the answers, right? Because it's not like you just go out there and Google, how do I heal myself in a healthy way? <laughs> you know, it doesn't really bring up the right answers. It'll be like pharmaceutical 101, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. So one of the things I want to point out is I kind of intentionally asked the question that way and like oh, push through those struggles. And I want to see if you might pick up on that. And because yes, sometimes we do need to find ways to push through, but other times it's just about softening and allowing it. And something we talked about this morning with breath work, like how energy, how emotions are energy in motion, right? So if we resist something, right, and then we try to push through it, a lot of times it's just going to be pushed back. Can we sit there, feel into it, like the 90 second rule, which for those of you guys listening, most people are familiar with the five second rule by Mel Robbins. She talks about five, four, three, two, one. Let me go do this hard thing, like a cold bath, ice bath, whatever it might be. Whereas the 90 second rule is when one of those emotions comes up in the body and you get so flustered, your heart is beating, your, your body temperature changes. Can you give yourself 90 seconds? Because it actually takes the body 90 seconds to have a physiological response and then it moves through you, which is proof and showing that, yes, emotions are energy in motion. So a lot of times it's not so much about pushing through it, but allowing it and soft, softening. And, and these tools that you mentioned, like your sound bath and breath work, community, all these sorts of things are great ways to really work together for accountability, to be seen, to be heard, to be witnessed, to have reflections. So that you can really surrender to it versus numbing yourself out at, with distractions. Because I think the mainstream, going back f full circle here, with the theme of the lockdowns, and it, to your point, it giving people an opportunity to go within, I think a lot of people were like, how can I not feel this? How can I push through this? And that's through distractions, whether it be sports, it be movies, it be shows, it be alcohol, it be drugs, it be news, all of these sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't easy. COVID was, you know, a kick in the pants for everybody. And it really was important to have community though, then mm -hmm. I think. And that just reflected more that we look to a bigger, wider circle to help ourselves and ask for help. You know, like it's not weakness to ask for help when you need help. You got to ask for help. That's strength. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. So let's transition a little bit to some witchcraft topics, if you will, right? Okay. I led a full moon ceremony for our group Structured Flow and asked you to help facilitate that because I know that's something that you are so passionate about. And you actually led a cord cutting ceremony for us. And, you know, people say cord cutting a lot when they're like getting out of a relationship or trying to make changes. Can you describe like what a cord cutting ceremony looks like? Yeah, well, it could be a cord cutting with an individual, a person, but it could also be with like something that you're dependent on, right? Something that you want to shed. And really, it's about releasing that and allowing the good things to come in, you know, just getting rid of the toxins and allowing the good things to come in. So it's kind of like the breath work. You, you make, you know, you release all the bad and then you let the flow of the good come in. And it's much the same thing. And the idea behind it really is not to ever have 
malice or or wish ill on anyone. It's not about that at all. It's about focusing goodness and refocusing that energy where people need to be and giving them what they need to be because obviously what you may have thought or you together as a couple may have thought was good isn't anymore or even you as you and your family member or even you and your boss it could be really anyone so it's really a method to say to yourself I don't I don't need this anymore it doesn't serve me I'm going to let go of it and let something good come and fill its place 100%. And if someone would want to conduct a cord cutting ceremony, like what's the how behind it? Yeah. So you're going to take a candle and you can write a name or uh, a word or intention on the side of the candle and of what you want to release, right? And then you're going to tie it with a cord. I like to tie it with a silver cord, but you tie it with a cord. And a lot of people do it with a red candle if it's a lover white is also really good spiritual color as well. So then you put it in salt or usually salt or sand, but salt's better because it's a cleaner type environment. And you put it in that and you light both of them at the same time, both candles. You After you've wrapped in a figure eight, like infinity, uh-huh. both candles. And don't do it too far down because it takes a long time for the candles to burn. Yeah, we learned that, right, Sam? Yeah, yeah, totally. So you take two candles and white or red if it's a lover, if you'd like, and then you sit them in salt. Is that what you said? Yeah, so you're going to sit them in the salt and you're going to put the cord around them in a figure eight. So they're tied together Mm -hmm. with an eight. And so then... And you can put your intention on the side of the candle if you want or what you want to release or the person's name. And then when you light them, you light them at the same time. And then as they burn, you kind of observe what's going on. Like is one side kind of burning hotter than the other? Uh. Are they burning at the same time? Did one side go out? All kinds of things can happen. It's weird. Sometimes they kind of spark a lot or they spit to the side, something like that. And you can kind of just observe that. And there's a lot on the internet that kind of tells different interpretations of that. But it's kind of pretty simple. Like if one side is burning and the other isn't, that person that's burning is the person that is letting go. And the other one is holding on. on. Yeah, for sure. So you'd kind of, before you start the ceremony, be like, oh, this is this candle on the left or the right. It doesn't matter represents you no it doesn't i just if you scribble the name just make sure you got that right oh got it yeah you mentioned that the intention so just know before you start to identify one candle as yourself and one as the person that you're cutting the cord with right and then when like say like if your candle is burning that means oh like i'm letting this go but the other person's isn't burning, what do you do then? Because obviously, like, if the other person's is burning and they're letting it go, but yours isn't, then you're like, oh, okay, I, I have more work to do around this. That's pretty clear. But if the the other person's, like, then what's the recommendation? Well, really, the most important part is when it gets down and starts to burn the cord. Mm-hmm. And you want to see what direction that goes in. Mm. And kind of how that relationship is. And that really shows, you know, who's splitting from whom. But you can see that in the burning too. If they're burning kind of together, they kind of are still holding on. They're still wanting to work on things. There's still there's still something there. There's still work to be done. There's still lessons to be learned, perhaps. So there there could be a connection there, right? And but if it if it burns to one side, that's definitely one person releasing the other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is getting into interesting territory because our nervous system is essentially the electrical network of our body. And then bringing in more like metaphysics, if you will, we have a Merkaba of energy surrounding us the whole time. And then when we intertwine with people, whether it's partners, friendships, parents, siblings, you know, kids, whatever, friends, whatever it might be, 
we energetically connect with them and create a cord. And that's really what this is about so that people listening fully understand this. The candles are a representation of that energetic cord. So a lot of this, you know, in my personal belief, especially bringing it back to quantum physics is like the belief you have into it, you know, and if you're not buying into any of this stuff, then of course, you're probably not going to see any results because your mind is really what's controlling your reality. And I'm reading Joe Dispenza's book right now from 2012, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. And he really gets into this deep and it's, you can look at any of Dispenza's work to really understand this stuff on a deeper level. Yeah. Yeah. And really, it's, it takes a lot of work to figure out where you're at and where you want to be. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some people never get there. And it's great to at least want to work on yourself and want to be better for yourself and your community. I mean, because we're all attached in that energetic way, right? Yep. On that note, we're going to take a quick commercial break to speak about community, and we're going to invite our friend Punk Rock Aaron to come on the pod to tell us about set and setting. Come on over, Aaron. (laughs) Excellent. Yeah, it's great to have you here. It was great to have you do breath work here today and bring that practice into the community a little bit more. And setting, yeah, we're a retail store as well as a community and gathering space here in Morro Bay. And it was always my intention to bring community together and the ripples that come out of that, like from this podcast and your experience here, is entirely the reason why we do it. So check us out, mysetandsetting.com. And on Instagram at My Set and Setting. And yeah, come visit us. We have some really excellent conversations here. Not all of them are recorded, thank goodness. (laughs) Yeah, we do. Yeah. And it's really a great community. And I must say, it's it's very transformative. And it's what you make of it. And Aaron's a great partner for people. And when... When you're really going through a lot and when you need to have some support in your integration and you need to understand like the integration on the front end, back end, you know, she can help with that and help facilitate that because that's what it's all about. It's about working through these things and getting on the right path so that we have a lot of healthy people on the planet and not a bunch of messed up people (laughs) really that's a nice very nice way of putting it and and we all do that together this community has been truly amazing for our little ten thousand person town we're doing all right yeah yeah we are okay i'm gonna turn it back over to our host now (laughs) sweet thank you aaron appreciate you sharing what you guys are all about and hosting us here at your space kind of put you on the spot there, bringing you up from the audience, but uh, I had the right shirt. yeah, you had yeah. the right shirt on. Most people are listening anyways. All right. So continue where we left off. We said we last were talking about cord cuttings and, you know, I'd like to get into some more themes like that. One of which is Oracle cards. Well, or actually, is this a tarot deck? It says this tarot. Is a tarot deck. Oh, sweet. All right, I'll turn it over to you, Tracy, whatever you want to share. So this is the Tarot of the Divine. It's a deck um, that I really like. And so I just laid it out and I had, I picked a card and Sam picked a card. So I just thought this would be kind of fun if I read to you what this is. And if you know Sam or or me, then it's kind of telling here. So Wh- which are we starting first? Are we doing a game here? Have... Starting with you. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, yeah. It could have been fun with Well, me. we can mix, mix it up. No, nah, we'll start with me. Go okay. for it. Okay. All right. So he got the King of Swords, which is kind of a cool image. And uh, it's the griffin from Persia, Persian mythology. The King of Swords represents wisdom enhanced by power. The griffin is a noble and intelligent creature. Soaring over land and sea, a symbol for patience, perseverance, and judgment. And in the upright position, it means authority, structure, logic, self-discipline, and loyalty. And yeah, that pretty much sums up Sam. 
I would say compassionate too could be thrown in there. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you. Thank you for throwing compassion in there. Yeah. Kind and loving too. But like, that's all your, like your man. Yeah. Even structures in there. Yeah. Male. Lies in there. Authority. Yeah. Logic. Self-discipline. All those good things. So I got the hermit. It's Druid and White Stag from Ireland and Celtic legend. The hermit represents solitude and living responsibilities behind, leaving responsibilities behind to focus inward. In the Celtic myths, the elusive white stag encourages people to drop everything and pursue spirituality. And in this position, it means introspection, withdrawal, prudence, insight, and meditation, which is kind of what I've been doing for the past six months. Yeah, it, the hermit does definitely seem like the phase where you're at right now, for sure, based off of that description. Yeah, I think so. And I think today kind of, if I'm going to get kicked into the next phase, today would be the catalyst for that. I think. Yeah? Yeah, I do. I do. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so l- let's talk about today's experience, because your first time doing smack breath work. We did it this morning, and I told you since I was coming down here visiting, like, hey, you might want to just be in your own energy. You, typically, a lot of times for me, after I do a breathwork journey, I get very introverted. I want to be by myself. And I don't want to talk uh, too much. But you you were like, no, let's let's record. Let's, let's talk. So is there anything that you feel like sharing about the experience? And also know like you don't have to share anything at all. Just saying how transformative is good enough, you know? Oh, yeah, I'm I'm willing to share. I would just, I would say that, like, as we went, so when we started, we kind of warmed up a little, and then we were working on the sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight, flight, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's, for me, kind of uncomfortable. I'm sure for some other people, maybe it is, but there's also good things there. And uh, so we did that for... Three rounds? Three rounds, correct. And holding our breath. I don't know how long I held my breath for, but it felt like a long time. It was at least two minutes. It was? It was at least two minutes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. I, I asked everyone before, I was like, how long do you think you can hold your breath? And everyone said, you know, 30, 30 seconds, seconds or something <laughs> like that. And I was like, well, you're going to be, hold, be able to hold it at least two minutes, maybe even three. And It's always funny when people do breath work for the first time. I know I was blown away too. Like, how is that possible? So yeah, it was definitely at least two minutes. Wow. Okay. Well, so yeah, when I did that, I think in the third round, Sam came over and he was like, okay, you can, and he's like, like the more you kind of scream, the better kind of results you'll have. So let it go. And, you know, nobody else was screaming. So you're like, am I going to be the first one that screams? You're always thinking that in the back of your head because that's what our little monkey mind does to us. So anyway, of course, I'm going through that. And then I'm like, oh, screw it. I can't control it anyway. And just really a lot of sobbing, crying and screaming, whatever. And but good. Felt really good to release that. And, you know, I've been crying a, a ton for about a month and it feels good to just have some lucidity and not have the waterworks and have some clearness of mind and not be so emotional i know it's good to release it and that i got to do that too but it's good to have some control back for sure Mm -hmm. and have like a, a space that's created for that versus like the spontaneous outburst not outburst but you know waterworks i guess is a better way of saying it yeah, like the uncontrollable nature yeah. of that, you know what I mean? Because we're we're adults and we have jobs and, and families and different things that we got to attend to. And it's like you don't want to constantly, well, even at the grocery store, you want to be able to go to the grocery store and not lose your mind, you know, and have a calm, you know, experience. And when you're going through a lot of complex trauma, a lot of stuff comes up. And as you sort through it, it's, it's okay to, to you know, have good days and bad days. It's okay to even realize that you aren't the best person sometimes at certain times in your life, you know, like you could have done better. And, and that 
like people that you love could have done better. And that hurts. But that's stuff we can't control. So you also realize that. You realize, you know, can't control it. They did the best they could do. And I'm not going to let it control my life because that's just going to suck the life out of me. So I'm um, really being in Sam's group made me see like these beautiful humans made me see, well, first of all, like you got to work on yourself. And if you're not, that's really sad and unfortunate. Then I would say the other things that came through for me were that you you need a partner that's working on themselves too, because life's hard enough, like you grow at different rates anyway. And when you're not aligned in that, it's just so, so hard. You'll, you'll never get there. You'll just pull yourself out of that whole possibility. So I just like to focus, you know, on what I can control and really stay in the moment. That's the third thing. Just stay in the moment and breathe when you can't control things and you need to bring yourself down and have some control over your your nervous system. And we were talking the other day, like, I don't know what the meme was, but I sent you something and it was like, why do we call it the nervous system? I mean, oh, yeah. Because words have such impact, right? It's like kind of self-deprecating. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be the unnervous system, but the chill system. That's what it was, the chill yeah, system. the chill system. I like that. So we should recoin that. We'll just have to write that. Medical journals, rewrite everything. Well, words are spells, you know, and... When this first, w thank you for sharing all of that before we go there. Yes, I want to highlight the fact that you said that they and you were doing the best that they and you could do. That is such an important reminder. And to come back to the present moment, accessing the breath is a great way to come back to the ner this present moment. And one of the hardest things to do is work on yourself, right? And do all this quote unquote work, all these different healing modalities, then the heat in the moment, not be able to access those tools and resources. But if you consistently come back to your breath, just like I told you guys this morning, when you're having a conversation with someone or for you guys listening right now, notice if you have a intentionality with your breath. Right? Like it, we hold on to our breath so much. The other day, I think I was writing a post or I was writing something. I don't remember, but I was like, oh my God, this entire time for like three minutes, I'm just holding my breath. And I tr have this inner dialogue going on that's like kind of, okay, come back to her when someone's talking. I do my be best, not in an awkward and weird way, but just like have a few intentional inhales and exhales versus just like having that shallow breath. And that is a great way a great practice to become more present so that there's a reason why this practice, right? So that when we're on the big stage, the big stage being the heat of the moment, we can regulate our chill system. Right. Yeah. Right. And we want to regulate our chill system. I mean, that's the whole idea to like have calm and peace and serenity, serenity in our lives and to em emulate that to others. Right. And, to just get there is not always easy, but part of it's surrender. Yeah. And that's the hard part sometimes. That's like the scary part, I'll say. For sure. It absolutely <laughs> is. And that's why for those of you guys listening, know that you are not alone. Know that this work takes bravery. It takes an immense amount of courage and it come back to finding gratitude for yourself. You know, I think so often we send gratitude and we send love back, but we really need to focus on just having that gratitude, that compassion and that love for yourself. And as we start to wrap this up, getting into words being spells, when I was in my first ayahuasca ceremony back in 2019, this, this woman said something in her share circle about feeding two birds with one seed. And it literally blew my mind. Like I couldn't even at the time, like stay present with the rest of what she said, because it blew my mind about how many of our sayings, like stick, stick and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. 
BS words do hurt, right? Yes. And there's so many sayings, like just thinking about killing two birds with one seed. Why are we talking about killing two birds with one seed? Doesn't it make so, or killing two birds with one stone, doesn't it make so much more sense saying feeding two birds with one seed? And it's especially these words we use every day, like hell o. Yeah. And then we put it on our doormat and we have it written in front of our door. Not a good thing, people. Don't put hello in front of your door. <laughs> put welcome. And don't say good morning. Say grand rising. I got to say, I'm not on board with the grand rising one, but that's just me. I'm, I'm a it, contrarian. Morning. I do There's agree. There's just so many there. Though. I get it. So people know morning, like your morning. I, and I do, I do understand that. It's just sometimes like, you know me and most people listening, if you've listened to this podcast before, y'all know that I'm pretty chill and like, and I don't like to get too love and light and flowery language. And I like, there's certain things where I draw a line for me personally. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to be saying grand rising. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, totally I cool. No, say good morning too. Yeah. I mean, no shame, no judgment or anything just for me. But yeah, that said, there's so many words. Like once you start to open up to this, you be like, oh, that word, this word, that word. I wrote a whole section in my book, Soul Life Balance, about words and and looked up different phrases. A lot of them I didn't even have to look up. I just had to sit in contemplation and think about it and let them come to me. It's like, oh my God. And it all started back in that Aya ceremony. So I'm glad you brought that up about the nervous system and calling it the chill system. Yeah, well, and think about like television yeah, and all the stuff and, the, you know, Hollywood and all that. But. Television is for sure a good one, but we'll let, end on a lighter note. So, Tracy, yes. if you could wave your magic wand and change something about this human experience, what would it be? I would just tell everybody that it's all about love. It's all about unconditional love, loving yourself, loving your community, loving everybody. And, you know, if we all loved everybody, there would be no war. There would be, it'd be beautiful here. So on love, find love within and live from your heart. Don't always live in your brain. Don't overthink. I love it. Yeah. And, you know, with unconditional love. You know, so many times we think we understand unconditional love. And I think that's the problem with self-love where we get messed up with self-love because we automatically go to all these reasons why we can't love ourselves and why we're not worthy and why we're not lovable. But to your point, it all comes back to unconditional love. Yeah, especially with yourself. Mm hmm. Well, thank you so much. I see you. So thrilled to be here with you, do this podcast with you and be on this journey alongside you. I commend you for doing the work and thank you for taking the time. Hey, thank you, Sam. Thank you for changing my life. Oh, you're, you're so welcome. All right.